for a moment. I bet you have some change you want to make in your life or lifestyle. What is it? Every New Year's Eve, what do you keep resolving to do? Yeah, I know. It's not easy to change your life and get yourself together. Becoming something different than you are right now is a valiant endeavor. You need courage to take a good hard look at yourself. It takes a certain boldness of faith and thinking to do that thing. You must believe in what you cannot see and have the self-discipline to hang in there until a change comes. Then, when you have reached your goal and your life has changed for the better, your sense of self-togetherness is simply elegant. It is the elegance of earned self-togetherness. Dr. Cornell West defines the phrase, and I quote, It is a wonderful phrase that Albert Murray uses in his book, Stomping the Blues. The elegance of earned self-togetherness means you've got a self-confidence. You've got an elegance about you. You have a sense of being to persevere whatever the circumstances are, but to do it with dignity and with grace. This is Cherie Collins. Now here's Kim. a break camp experience in 2004. I always wanted to have my own business, even though I had had much success in my career. I always wanted to have my own coaching and consulting practice. I discovered what I was good at and loved very early in my career. I was a career coach during a summer internship at Michigan State University and then a peer coach my senior year. After graduation, I worked for several vocational schools in the Detroit area. I helped men and women who still had tethers on their legs or whose hands were swollen and they were still in drug rehabilitation. I helped them during a major change in their life to create the self-discipline to finish the vocational program, get a good job, and support themselves and their families. Later, I went to work for one of the largest national career management firms. I had senior leaders in my office crying because they were being downsized. I helped them find a way to make it through their transition. I taught workshops on career management, job search skills, and how to cope with change. This really started to shape my career, and I was loving it. In 1994, I got my big break. I was asked to be the project lead for a career development program that was for over 50,000 salaried employees. The program focused on the growth and development of each individual. This was a cultural change for employees. They had to face the fact, as each of us must do, that we are responsible for our own career, not our employers. This was a success. I loved my job, loved the people that I worked with, but there was still this yearning, this desire. I just couldn't shake. Imagine that thing you desire. You just can't shake it. I want you to think about that thing. Actually, the first step in making lasting change is to go from not thinking about it to thinking about it. Sometimes we're so beat down from discouragement, we don't even have the energy to hope. I definitely understand that. But you can't move forward without hope. The very first step is to make up your mind and renew your hope for the future. Hebrews 11 and 1 gives us a powerful biblical principle that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things unseen. Do you have faith that what you hope for can happen? If so, you can be excited that you have what it takes. Faith means different things to different people. For me, when I know God is backing my plan and I'm standing on his word and it's his will for me to succeed, I have all the evidence I need. I know I can win. So picture this, and there's a buyout circulating within the organization. I'm not offered the package, so I was going to have to ask. I was working in HR, which is the only reason I even understood how to ask. There was only one day left. I called up some friends, and I asked them to pray for me. 
I did what Queen Esther did in the Bible, and I asked my friends for support in prayer. I remember going to the lobby of the Weston Hotel and the Renaissance Center in Detroit. It's a beautiful lobby. I went there to pray. I had my journal. It was quiet. And I prayed. This was a very interesting time for me. And I had been reading about Jacob's descendants and their journey through the wilderness to the promised land. These were Abraham's descendants who were enslaved because of their greatness. After many years of being in slavery, God heard their cries and answered them. He freed them from their bondage. They were on their way to the land that was promised to them as part of their inheritance. As they reached the final leg of their journey, they rested. God spoke to them and he said, You've been at this mountain long enough. It's time to break camp and move on. They knew the land was good. They had sent spies in. It was everything they imagined and more. But they also discovered that after all they had been through, slavery, breaking free, going through the wilderness, they would have to fight these huge armies to take possession of the land. Have you ever felt like that? You're at the end of your rope, and finally you can see what you're hoping for right there. You're so close. Yet before you is the biggest battle that you've ever had. They had every reason to believe they would experience victory. They had experienced victory up to this point. Being freed from slavery, going through the wilderness, having enough food to eat. Yet they let fear stop them. They complained and wished this had never happened. This resulted in them wandering around for 40 years. 40 years in the wilderness. Stuck. I felt like I had been wandering around, stuck for 40 years. I didn't want to be stuck any longer. I went home that night, and when I woke up, I had my answer. I went to work the next day and asked for the buyout. What about you? What's your mountain? Have you been there for way too long? It's time to break camp. It's time to make that first move. Now, when I broke camp, what was hard was making the change. Change is hard. Think of your issue. Think of your mountain. Half of all Americans make resolutions at the beginning of every year. 77% keep those resolutions for one week. 55% after one month. 41% after six months. And only 19% after two years. One client put it this way. She said, she realizes that she has to push even harder when a distraction comes her way. She has to push a little more so she won't get stuck in the same rut she'd been at for almost 10 years. There's a coaching strategy that I've used to help clients find the motivation to change. There are two kinds of motivation. There's pain and pleasure. We tend to be motivated by fear. The fear of what might happen if we don't change. And we're also motivated by the pleasure that's associated with the possibilities of what could happen if we do. So think about that area in your life that needs your attention. Think about what might happen if you don't make any changes in your career, in developing anger management, being a better mother, father, wife, or husband, finding work-life balance, getting organized, stress management, getting healthy and fit, whatever your issue is, what would be the outcome if you never change? How would that make you feel? What would be the outcome in the short and the long term? Hmm. Now flip that and think about what would be the positive outcome if you do change. What might be the positive outcomes in the short and the long term and how would that make you feel? Just thinking about these things can jumpstart you on your way to success. What are your sources of motivation? Do you ever take time out, press pause, to think strategically? Exploring your own thoughts and feelings? What might happen if you don't change? What might happen if you do?
if you really want to shift your mindset to success and get ready to change, take some time, think through your sources of motivation. Unfortunately, many of us are only motivated by fear. And what's worse is that many people worry about it, but that still doesn't move them to action. If that's you, I hope you'll break camp and move on. I found this great model that I use to explain to my clients how change works. I love this model. It was developed by researchers who studied people who successfully changed. They studied successful self-changers. It's called the trans-theoretical model of change. Change happens in stages. There are seven of them. Pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance, relapse, and transition. And I've been coaching long enough to know I can't motivate you to action if you're in denial or pre-contemplation. In pre-contemplation, you're saying, everything is great in my life. There's nothing I need to change. I actually had a lady at a seminar come up to me and say those exact words. But she was really looking for validation. She said, is it okay that I think everything is okay? I'm asked that question sometimes, and sometimes it's not denial. Rather, it's that they are content with their life. They are part of a rare breed that's actually got out of life what they wanted. And they didn't grow bored as soon as they settled into their blessings. They're living their vision. And I think that's great. I've promised myself that each time I actually reach a goal, I'll enjoy it. I won't look for reasons to complain or get bored. I'll celebrate success by living my vision. So if you're thinking that everything is great and you're living your vision, I celebrate your success. But that doesn't let you off the hook. There are two kinds of goals everybody deals with external and internal. Internal goals are about how our conduct must change in order to get or keep the external goals. So I hope you'll decide to work on yourself. Personal development is a lifetime project. Some people I meet say they don't need to change, but deep down, they really want to. They have external and internal roadblocks to success. One client described her experience of deciding to break camp as finally getting to the heart of the matter. She says she finally got it. The feature strategy is to do a life review. You look at the choices you've made. Every path you've chosen means you've left another one behind. And those paths can lead you to your dreams. Doing a review during a life transition is powerful. It makes the difference between stagnation and growth. And I know you don't want to stay stuck. There are many times in life that it's good to do a life review. In your early 20s, it's good. When you're graduating college and transitioning to the world of work. Or around 25 to 27. Some people call this a pre-midlife. And it's a good time to do a life review. Midlife transition between 35 and 45. That's a great time. From 55 to 65 is an excellent time to do a life review. It's a time of transition, or for some, a time of reinventing oneself. My mom's in her 70s, and at this stage of life, a review can be so healthy. You, or if you're reinventing yourself, you celebrate your successes and acknowledge your role in the dreams you did not pursue. Then you make a decision. Some dreams you may decide you cannot or do not want to pursue any longer. You make time to grieve those dreams and let it go. Once you've let go of certain dreams, you'll have more energy and drive to pursue the ones you still desire. Once you own your own role and stop blaming others, or blaming God, or feeling sorry for yourself, once you do this, I've seen people get a renewed sense of hope. They believe that this time, this time they can win. Okay, let me share the steps for completing your own life review. When I was in corporate America, I would take teams through a historical review of their life as a team. One way for an individual to do a life review is to use a process called a choice map. On a large piece of paper, draw a line long enough to represent your age. Write numbers below the line in five-year segments of time, from when you were born to your present age. For each significant decision you've made in your life, draw a dot at that approximate year on the line. 
From that dot, draw a slanted line upwards and write the decision that you've made. Next, illustrate the force of that significant decision by drawing a slanted line downward from the same dot. On the slanted line below, write what might have happened if you hadn't made that decision, but rather the opposite. Continue this process as you review your life to date. Just focus on the major life decisions. Think about what you left behind. In many cases, the path you didn't choose was one that wouldn't have been good for you in the first place. Celebrate those decisions and where they've taken you. But sometimes when my clients do a life review, they discover dreams they wish they had pursued. If this is the case, the next step is to decide if the goals that you did not pursue are still a viable option or if they're no longer possible for you. I have clients in their 40s deciding if they still want or can have the children they dream of having. Some determine that they don't want or can't have children now, so they must take time to grieve this loss. After you set aside time to grieve those goals, I mean take the time to feel the sadness and the pain. Now you don't want to get stuck here, but you do want to do the work necessary to bury those dreams. Then, determine the paths you did not take that you want to and can now take. Make a list of those goals that you want to pursue. A new job, a new home, a new city to live in, a different career, money saved for retirement, some type of community service project that you've always dreamed about. To get married. Start a family. These are your external goals. Now also record your lessons learned from your life review. This is how we discover our internal personal development goals that we may need to work on. Let me share one of mine with you. This is very personal. I realized from my past relationships including a divorce, that I needed to work on my temperament. I put a plan together, and I learned how to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. This has changed my life and my relationships. Maybe you want to build up an aspect of your character or shift your attitude about a particular situation. Now pick one of those goals and commit to focusing on it during the coaching process. Once you learn the program, you can use it to reach additional goals that you want to pursue. But for now, just pick one. What is your goal? Even the most successful people have at least one area in their life where they're stuck. What do you hope for? Think about it. Have you made up your mind to make the first move? I sure hope so. Hope is like a beacon of light. If you have hope, you get excited about the possibilities. You believe that what was once impossible is now possible. This is the first step, but you have to take it. Don't waste another minute of your life. What are you waiting for? You've been at this mountain long enough. It's time to break camp. It's time to make the first move.